Schaefer Lectureship was established in 1929 by a gift from John C. Schaefer of Chicago as a memorial to his son, Kent, uh, PhD 1907. The indenture uh, provides for lectures to be given on the life, character, and teachings of Jesus. The series is given every second year, alternating with the Nathaniel W. Taylor lecture series. Our distinguished lecturer this year is Christopher Rowland, Dean Ireland's professor of the exegesis of Holy Scripture in the University of Oxford and fellow of Queen's College, Oxford, a post which he has held since 1991. Uh, professor Rowland was educated at Christ College, Cambridge, where he was a contemporary of Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and where he graduated with first-class honors in theology. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on the origins of Jewish mysticism and its impact on Christian origins. His first university appointment was at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. Subsequently, he served as fellow and dean of Jesus College, Cambridge. His research and writing have been concerned with the history of apocalypticism, and he has a long-standing interest in Latin American liberation theology and was for a decade chair of Christian Aid's Latin American and Caribbean Committee, which was the British Church's development work in, uh, prov provides for British uh, Church's development work in Latin America. His published works are many, and they include The Open Heaven, a study of apocalyptic in Judaism and early Christianity, all the way through the Cambridge Companion to Liberation Theology, published in 2007. We're absolutely delighted to have Christopher with us and look forward to his lectures. The overall theme of the Schaefer Lectures this year is from impulse, not from rules, the life, character, and teachings of Jesus in the light of the prophecy, poetry, and art of William Blake. And today's lecture will be on William Blake on the life and teaching of Jesus. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rowland here. thank the Dean for his warm welcome and for the honour of being invited to give these Schaefer lectures and in particular the uh, particular <coughs> privilege of giving these lectures in the context of uh, the convocation for 2008. Before I start, just a word about the handout that you've got. Um, about halfway through the lecture I'm going to take you through uh, two pieces of William Blake text. I'm I've tried to do it as expeditiously as possible, but uh, on the back of the first page, uh, you've got the text written out, but it will also be put up here um, on, on the screen. Um, I'll read the text so you've got a chance to assimilate it, and there will be a second, shorter extract um, uh, towards the end of the lecture. A mile or so from Yale Divinity School, just around the corner from the <coughs> hotel where I'm staying, in the Yale Centre for British Art, <coughs> you can look at one of the treasures of English literature, and one might add, one of the great treasures of theology in the English language as well. It's a unique illuminated version of William Blake's Jerusalem the first two plates of which you've got up there on the screen. Now, I don't mean the famous stanzas which have become England's unofficial national anthem, of which more in a moment. I'm talking about Blake's last major illuminated text, Jerusalem. One of my graduate students heard that I was going to be in New Haven a year ago and told me, that if I did nothing else, I should see this text. She was right. That afternoon, I spent looking at this beautifully illuminated and exquisitely executed work was unforgettable. I kept pinching myself as I looked at the extraordinary colouring and the detail, which at times seemed to leap out of the page at me in a kind of 3D effect. And this is the page in particular which uh, uh, has stayed with me. Um, the image at the bottom there of the woman above the uh, reclining figure who I take to be Albion, symbolising Britain, and 
the woman probably symbolizing Jerusalem, uh, the heroine of the story. But what stayed with me was looking at the fringes of her dress and uh, what uh, you can see at the bottom there, which you just doesn't come across in the digitized version, of those uh, little balls at the uh, uh, bottom of her dress there, which are, uh, kind of stand out from the text uh, when one looks at it. I kept reminding myself that this was probably created from inspiration via a complicated process of engraving and by carefully crafted illumination by an engraver who was living on the fringes of poverty. Blake, despite having hardly enough to keep himself and his wife Catherine alive, spent money on expensive paints, not to mention hours of patient labour, to create this masterpiece. The fact that there is only one example of this complete version, I think, is a reminder of the cost, not only in terms of labour, but also the expense, which probably prohibited any further copies like it being made. The engraving and the printing together enabled this self-proclaimed prophet to match inspiration with production in ways which have rarely been equal. The complexity of the words and the designs should not stop us admiring this representative of Blake's art. And the examples that I've given you are among the less exotic and enigmatic of the images which one might find. The lavish way in which Blake illuminated this book, and indeed all his illuminated books, as with the icon painters of Orthodox Christianity, or the medieval scribes of the Western Church, reflected his conviction that the book contained in word and picture a vehicle of redemption. It was worth spending the money on. For, as Blake put it in another engraving, roughly contemporary with Jerusalem, I quote, Christianity is art and not money. Money is its curse. The Old and New Testaments are the great code of art. Jesus and his disciples were all artists. End of quotation. Art, for Blake, was not just an aesthetic experience, but part of what he termed the, that which enabled the mental fight which was needed to build Jerusalem. It was part of the spiritual warfare in which he believed he was engaged to awaken slumbering spirits from their adherence to state religion and what he called mutant sleep the confining of perception to sense experience, and the exclusion of the poetic genius which he identifies with the spirit of prophecy. Which brings me to these lectures, whose theme is the life, character and teachings of Jesus. I hope that, at the very least, the three lectures will offer an introduction to an important chapter of the history of interpretation of the life and teaching of Jesus. But I'd like to think there will be more to ponder too. Blake's life, spanning as it does a turbulent period, not only in political history, but also in the history of ideas, touches on a variety of issues which are of importance for studies of students of the Gospels. The method I've adopted in these lectures reflects some hints offered by Blake at various points in his writings. I'll explicitly sketch what I consider to be a key part of his hermeneutics in Lecture 2 and apply it to my reading of one of the more enigmatic of the pictures of the life of Jesus. Blake's hermeneutics may be characterised by the need for an attention to what he calls, and I quote, minute particulars in both images and text. The juxtaposition of text and image stimulating the imagination and the importance of the involvement of the interpreting subject in engaging with and contributing to the understanding of his texts and images. I shall follow a similar method myself in the interpretation of Blake's art and his writing. Added to this, I'll bring a historical perspective to bear as I seek to locate Blake in the history of theological exegesis and assess what contribution his very distinctive art may continue to offer to contemporary biblical interpretation. I should stress, my perspective is that of a biblical scholar 
interested in the history of interpretation. I have no inter uh, uh, pretensions to be either an art historian or an expert in English Romanticism. I have learnt much from Blake's scholarship in both of these areas, as will be apparent throughout these lectures. The details of Blake's life may be briefly told. He was born in 1757 and died in 1827. He was married to Catherine, who was in his later years his collaborator in his engraving and printing. He lived most of his life in London, with the exception of a few difficult years in Felpham in Sussex. They were difficult because they marked a time of great personal upheaval when the ideas which formed his long illuminated poems, Milton and Jerusalem, <laughs> took shape. He was put on trial at this time for sedition, the comments he was alleged to have made to an English soldier. He was a skilled, trained engraver who pioneered his own technique. This remained the basis of his art. After his move back to London, he lived in obscurity and on the fringes of poverty, indebted to the support of patrons like Thomas Butts, for whom he painted, painted over 300 biblical scenes, some of which we will be seeing over the next couple of days. Only in the last years of his life was he discovered and lauded by a small group of artists. On the screen here, you've got the words which are popularly known as Jerusalem, taken from a preface Blake wrote for his long poem, Milton. They're full of biblical themes. I think if Blake had wanted evidence of the ability of his words to rouse all sorts and conditions of people, then no better example could be found than on the way these words have had their impact across the political and the age spectrum. They encapsulate so much of what is distinctive about Blake as an artist and a poet, full of biblical themes, as I've said, not least themes from the book of Revelation. They finish with that quotation from the Book of Numbers. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Blake's conviction that every honest man is a prophet informs his use of the Bible in four short stanzas of his poem, London. You've got two versions of it here, both of which are in the Yale Centre for British Art. And I wanted to juxtapose the two because I think they are an example of the way in which Blake um, illustrated and painted with different colours that the basic poem. And there you've got uh, two of the copies, um, which, as I say, are in the Yale Centre. Let me read the stanzas. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of work. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most, through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hopes. Angry words. Two versions, deliberately illuminated differently for different effects. There's much one could say about text and images, but it's the biblical allusions in the opening stanza I want to focus on. In Ezekiel 9, the prophet saw a man clothed with linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. Ezekiel 9.3, setting a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst of Jerusalem. These words inspire Blake, the poet-prophet's observation of what he sees and hears, what he marks in the streets of his Jerusalem, London. But the marks here are not the marks of salvation. For like the marks of the beast in Revelation 13, these marks consign the inhabitants to woes brought on by a society which outwardly may be upright, but scratch the surface, one finds a sorry tale of suffering and pain. It is the vocation of the poet-prophet 
to mark the marks of the beast and of the eschatological woes in his midst. Church and monarchy, together, participate in the life of misery for the hapless victims of the chartered streets of economic change, which was late 18th and early 19th century London. The first stanza of this poem shows us Blake actualising biblical texts, words and images, especially from Blake's favourite prophet Ezekiel, are an inspiration to Blake, the poet-prophet, convinced as he is that he acts in continuity in his own time and place with the spirit of prophecy which fired Ezekiel and later John of Patmos. Two examples of the ways in which Blake engaged with the Gospels will form the core of this lecture. They exemplify Blake's creative reading of the Gospels. The first of these is the reading of the story of the woman taken in adultery, which forms part of an unfinished poem entitled The Everlasting Gospel. The second is Blake's reading of Matthew 1, 19 to 22, which touches on a theme which dominated his writing in the second half of his life, the gospel being the forgiveness of sins. As it stands, the Everlasting Gospel contains several attempts to versify the story of Jesus who is presented throughout as a dissident, humble towards God, proud towards man, as Blake puts it. The title, The Everlasting Gospel, echoes Revelation 14, verse 6, but also coincides with the significant role that this phrase plays in the apocalyptic theology of Joachim and Fiori. As David Erdman, one of this unfinished poem's major interpreters, points out, these deceptively simple verses mark a return to some of the themes of Blake's work uh, nearly 30 years before. In his illuminated text of the 1790s, Blake set himself to challenge religion and politics, particularly their ways of interpreting the Bible, which used it as a text to support the status quo in church and state. The life and teaching of Jesus plays a brief but crucial role, and Blake depicts Jesus as one who, according to his satirical work, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, I quote, acted from impulse, not from rules. Like some of the critics of his day, who questioned the holistic character of the Pentateuch, Blake played with the different names for the divinity, and, we shall see, in the everlasting gospel, uses the ambiguous relationship between Jehovah and the angel of the Lord in the Pentateuch to explore tensions in divinity between justice on the one hand and mercy on the other. And so, to the woman taken in adultery. I'm not going to read out the biblical passage, you've got it there. I just want to say something, juxtaposing image and text, as Blake is wont to, to do, about this picture, which you have in, before you now. In his watercolour, Interpreting this passage, we see the woman's hands are tied. She has her left breast bare and her hair dishevelled. Blake captures the moment in John 8.10 with Jesus saying, He that is with sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her, and stooping to the ground for the second time. The accusers retreat. One can see there one of the accusers' feet turning away. And Jesus is left alone with the woman. It's a very personal moment. And in this respect, it's very different from Rembrandt's interpretation. I'm just going to allow myself one image by another artist, and this is it. <laughs> You'll see here, Rembrandt in this interpretation takes seriously the setting of the biblical passage in the temple. The grand columns, back there in the shadows, and the shadow and reality theme, I think, been brought out very well here. But another contrast between Blake's and Rembrandt's portrayal is that in Blake's picture, the woman is standing, whereas she's kneeling in an attitude of reverence in the Rembrandt picture. Indeed, it's Jesus who is stooping in the ground, to the ground, in effect, bowing before the woman. This is one of those possibilities that I think that Blake found in the biblical text and exploited to make his point about the divine image already being in the woman 
was Jesus the divine in human honours by seemingly bowing down before her. But notice, Jesus' fingers are stooping down, but not quite touching the earth, as the woman watches his actions. He seems to point to a space where the woman can be, which the accusers have vacated. A space near him, but between the two of them. His right leg is turned towards the woman, and the woman's left foot slightly moves towards Jesus. And so, to the words. As I go through the text, I want to point to the, to the major outlines of the poem, rather than comment in every detail. And I've selected certain parts to look at a little more closely. <laughs> The version on the handout is what you're going to see on the screen, with the exception of the addition of some biblical reference that I put on the handout. The poem uh, is the version in the latest edition of David Edmund's Complete Poetry and Prose of William Blake. I've tried to number the lines in fives for convenience of identification. And as I go through the poem, I'll consider some Blake images, which I think are apposite to themes touched on in the poem. But first, I'm going to read it to you. Was Jesus chaste, or did he give any lessons of chastity? The morning blushed fiery red. Mary was found in adulterous bed. Earth groaned beneath and heaven above trembled at discovery of love. Jesus was sitting in Moses' chair. They brought the trembling woman there. Moses commanded be she be stoned to death. What was the sound of Jesus' breath? He laid his hand on Moses' law. The ancient heavens in silent awe, writ with curses from pole to pole, all away began to roll. The earth, trembling and naked lay, in secret bed of mortal clay. On Sinai felt the hand divine, putting back the bloody shrine. And she heard the breath of God, as she heard by Eden's flood. Good and evil are no more, Sinai's trumpet cease to roar. Cease, finger of God, to write. The heavens are not clean in thy sight. Thou art good and thou alone. Nor may the sinner cast one stone. To be good only is to be a god, or else a Pharisee. Thou angel of the presence divine, that didst create this body of mine, wherefore hast thou writ these laws and created hell's dark jaws? My presence I will take from thee. A cold leper thou shalt be. Though thou wast so pure and bright, that heaven was impure in thy sight. Though thy oath turned heaven pale, though thy covenant built hell's jail, though thou didst all to chaos rule with the serpent for its soul, still the breath divine does move, and the breath divine is love. Mary, fear not, let me see the seven devils that torment thee. Hide not from my sight thy sin, that forgiveness thou mayst win. Has no man condemned thee? No man, Lord. Then what is he who shall accuse thee? Come ye forth, fallen fiends of heavenly birth, that have forgot your ancient love, and driven away my trembling dove. You shall bow before her feet, you shall lick the dust for meat, and though you cannot love but hate, shall be beggars at love's gate. What was thy love? Let me see it. Was it love or dark deceit? Love too long from me has fled. T'was dark deceit to earn my bread. T'was covet, or t'was custom, or some trifle not worth caring for, that they may call a shame and sin love's temple that God dwelleth in, and hide in secret hidden shrine the naked human form divine, and render that a lawless thing on which the soul expands its wing. But this, O Lord, this was my sin when first I let these devils in, in dark pretense to chastity, blaspheming love, blaspheming thee. Thence rose secret adulteries, and thence did covet also arise. My sin hast that thou hast forgiven me. Canst thou forgive my blasphemy? Canst thou return to this dark hell, and in my burning bosom dwell? And canst thou die, that I may live? And canst thou pity and forgive? Then rolled the shadowy man away from the limbs of Jesus to make them his prey. An ever-devouring appetite, glittering with festering venoms bright. 
Try and crucify this cause of distress who don't keep the secrets of holiness. All mental powers by diseases we bind, but he heals the deaf, the dumb and the blind, whom God has afflicted for secret ends. He comforts and heals and calls them friends. But when Jesus was crucified, then was perfected his glittering prop. In three nights he devoured his prey, and still he devours the body of clay. For dust and clay is the serpent's meat, which never was made for man to eat. At several points, the fragments of the everlasting gospel start with questions. For example, was Jesus humble, or as here, was Jesus chaste? The answer to the question about chastity is given here by telling the story of the woman taken in adultery in John 8, whom, as we, as we can see, Blake identified with Mary Magdalene uh, via various interpretive moves, uh, including uh, links with uh, Luke 8, verse 2. The poem falls into four parts. First of all, there's Jesus' challenge to Moses' law, lines 5 to 28. Then there's a challenge to the angel of the divine presence, who is held responsible for the woman, and indeed Jesus' situation of having a body of flesh, <laughs> lines 29 to 40. In the third part, lines uh, 41 to 80, the focus turns to the woman and her growing awareness of the circumstances which led to her predicament. The final section, lines 81 to 96, concerns Jesus' death and how what happened to Jesus on the cross parallels what happened to the woman. And so part one, lines 5 to 28. Blake has Jesus sitting in Moses' chair, Matthew 23, verse 2, alluded to in line 7, thereby being placed in the tradition of Moses and having to make a judgment on the case. The critical character of Jesus' response is demonstrated by the language about cosmic disturbance in lines 10 to 20. The trembling of the earth, even Sinai, picking up themes from Psalm 18, earth shook and trembled, and especially Psalm 68, verse 8, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God, even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of the God of Israel. But this time, the earth-shattering events accompany a challenge to the law rather than the giving of the law. It's also an eschatological event, as the echo of a text like Revelation 6.14 indicates in line 14. The sky vanishing, rolled up like a scroll. The whole cosmos is affected. The poem turns from the cosmic effects back to the law in line 11. The hand divine this time is not writing laws, but manhandling Sinai and the bloody shrine. Reference probably to Exodus 20 to 24. In lines 19 to 20, there's a contrast between the woman, the first she in line 19, she heard the breath of God, with another she, I think, as she heard by Eden's blood, namely Eve. Both heard the breath of God, but whereas Eve heard condemnation, the woman heard forgiveness. The proclamation good and evil are no more asserts Blake's belief that the end of an era defining good and evil on the basis of the law has come to an end. With the words cease, finger of God to write, Jesus pronounces the end of the era of law, written on Sinai with the finger of God, alluding to Exodus 31. The cessation of writing laws means bringing to an end the contrast which result in exclusion and negation between uncleanness and cleanness, for example. God alone is good, an allusion to Mark 10.18, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But the consequence of that is that no sinner should cast one stone, in line 26. I need to point out that there is an alternative reading instead of God the devil there, in parenthesis in line 28, and that's a reminder to us, and to me in particular, that this poem was subject to revision by Blake, and the meaning Blake intended may have been in a, in a process of change. The image here, God writing on the tablets of stone. Just one thing I want to point you to. Note the hair of the divinity, blown from right to left here, almost at right angles with the head, reminiscent of the Ancient of Days in that 
famous evocation which uh, Blake did in various places. This is the preface to his prophecy, you. A wind coming from outside the picture, from, if I can put it like this, the eschatological east, the place where the Messiah is going to come from, where the day star will appear as we look at it. The spirit of prophecy, the eternal gospel, a pen impending upon the era of the Divine Father. I think if there's one image which I think kind of epitomizes Blake for me, it's, it's that, the, the, the compasses kind of uh, uh, circumscribing things, ordering things. But then the wind coming from outside the picture kind of ruffling the hairs and ruffling the situation where that order comes about. The imperative, cease finger of God to write, brings to mind John 8, where we read that Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Whatever else the words in John 8, 6 meant for Blake, they don't mean that he was writing a replacement law. I'm sure of that. I suggest, as I suggested when we considered the watercolour, the finger of Jesus is less writing than pointing to a space which the woman can occupy, and that she was just as much the divine in human as Jesus. So it's part two, lines 29 to 40. In the following passage, we have the judgment which Jesus passes on the angel of the presence for his part in bringing the woman caught in the act of adultery into her predicament of inhabiting a body of flesh and blood and subservience to the law, lines 30 and 31. Despite a dislocated and blighted world, in line 41, the breath divine that is love is still at work, and the consequences of its work manifest in the sound of Jesus' breath, from line 10, and then in the, every line that's following. Now, I just want to point you to an image which Blake did of the angel of the divine presence, this time clothing Adam and Eve after the, after the fall. This is uh, an interpretation of Genesis 3.21. Very different, benign figure here as compared with the angry words of the everlasting gospel. The angel of the presence appears here as elsewhere in Blake's later works, for, uh, for example in the Job engravings, as a demiurge, a lawgiver, a divinity reproached by Jesus for keeping humankind in thrall for a religion of law and the sanctions connected with it. It's tempting to find in Blake's theology what we may lose the term, Gnostic theology. Whether Blake could have known of the details of Sethian and Valentinian systems, I very much doubt. Be that as it may, one of Blake's most distinguished modern critics, Wharton Paley, has put it, and I quote, Blake was a monist who found his mythology trapping him in a dualistic position. He's right. But I would take it further, because uh, we get strong denunciation of dualistic ideas in Blake. And I'd add to this comment that Blake is also trapped in dualism by his exegesis of the Bible. He's gone back to the Pentateuch and kind of found fissures in uh, uh, ways in which God is, uh, is described, and particularly the relationship, the uh, strange relationship between God and the uh, um, Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, uh, in the Pentateuch. So Blake found the, in the Bible evidence about the complex nature of divinity and exploited the different names and attributes of God as a way of exploring the two contrary states, not only of the human soul, but also of the divinity. And two very famous poems by Blake, The Lamb and the Tiger, um, I think relate exactly to this. The two contrary states of the human soul, the two contrary aspects of divinity. The humility, meekness, gentleness, mercy of God in the Lamb, the, uh, the, 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 the way in which God is kind of beyond our comprehension, completely unpredictable, angry, the kind of apocalyptic wrathful of just God coming out in the way in which the tiger is described. I think, therefore, it's crucial to see the dualistic language here in the light of Blake's other work. However strong the emphasis on the overturning of the law and the regime of the angel of the divine presence in these lines of the everlasting gospel, Blake's emphasis is not on the negation of one by another, but on the balance of contrast, whether in the divinity or in the human person. What he found was a religion dominated by, if you like, by the tiger, and not enough by the lamb. 
So the hegemony of the demiurge and the religion of law is challenged and needs to be complemented by the religion of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin. <coughs> so the stern reprimand, I think, is more a redress of a balance lost than a negation of one divine principle by another. Part 3, lines 41 to 8. The focus then turns to the woman. Her experience of release prompts her to confess her shortcomings. Lines 45. Hide not thou thy sin. The woman's forgiveness she must win, line 46, by her recognition of what has gone on in her life. The allusion to John 8, 10 to 11, in lines 48 to 49, is followed by an exorcism, if that's the right word, in 49 to 52. Come ye forth, fallen fiends of heavenly birth, etc. Here, the, the, uh, there's a summoning forth of the seven devils that torment thee. Line 44, an allusion to Luke 8, 2. The reference in line 50, I think, that fallen fiends of heavenly birth may be to the angels who are condemned for consorting with women, mentioned in Genesis 6, 2. A story described at greater length in the Apocalypse of Enoch, chapters 7 to 10. Blake sketched scenes from we, one Enoch in the last years of his life probably sometime between 1824 and 1827, after Richard Lawrence's translation had been published in 1821. Here you've got one of the five images. So I think it represents the moment when one of the women, in bewilderment and terror, is confronted by two of the overbearing sons of God. The link with the seduction of the women by the angels raises the possibility that what we have in the everlasting gospel is Blake seeing in the story of the woman taken in adultery a reverse of this primeval event and its terrible consequences for the world. <coughs> the fallen fiends, instead of dominating the woman's life, become subordinate to her, line 53. Her tyranny over uh, uh, prompts Jesus to ask, What was thy love? Let me see it. Was it love or dark deceit? Lines 57 and 58. The distinction between love and dark deceit reflects Blake's view that love is not a crime. The sin to which Mary confesses is hypocrisy, a pretense to chastity. In allowing her life to be ruled by the seven devils, Mary turned love into deceit, a means to a covetous end, a mere habit, a repressed secret shame. From then on, as she became an object of shame, Line 63, the seven devils abode was in secret hidden shrine. Line 65, probably a reference to her body, something suggested by lines 65 and 66, and hide in secret hidden shrine, the naked human form divine. The woman's pretense to chastity let the devils in. Mary acknowledges that her sin is forgiven, but confesses that something even worse has taken place. Blaspheming love meant blaspheming Christ. Line 72. It's blasphemy against the Spirit, which has meant driving Christ out from her bosom. So to part four. In response to the woman's anguished question in line 80, to forgive the sin of blasphemy, and her plea to return to this dark hell in line 77, the poem dramatically changes perspective. At the moment Mary asks for pity and forgiveness, we have suddenly, out of the blue, a reference to the death of Jesus, crucified for being a cause of distress in line 85 and not keeping the secrets of holiness, line 86. The reference to the shadowy man in line 81, I think, is probably that part of the human person akin to what Blake elsewhere calls selfhood, whose power ends at death. I mean, I wonder whether it's something similar to what Paul describes as the body of flesh. Now, I think that this whole section is to be understood in the light of Colossians 2, 11 to 15. Just to remind you, Colossians 2, 11, there's a reference to the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And in 2, 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, nailing it to his cross. And finally, in 2, 15, the spoiling of the principalities and powers. Blake seems to have followed a pattern of interpretation in which the cross was seen as a moment when Christ divested himself of the principalities and powers 
by taking off the body of flesh. So Jesus' death turned out to be the victory in the teeth of defeat when Satan overstretched himself and had Jesus killed. So I would take the reference in line 92 to the perfecting of his glittering pride to be Satan's glittering pride. And uh, I have in mind this evocation of Satan in, in all his brilliance and glory, probably uh, picking up um, elements from Ezekiel chapter 28. The plausibility of the link to Colossians 2 is supported by other references to this passage from Colossians elsewhere in the everlasting gospel. Blake writes of Christ subduing the serpent bulk of nature's dross till he had nailed it to the cross, a clear reference to Colossians 2.14, and of Christ taking on sin in the virgin's womb and putting it off on cross and tomb. So Blake's emphasis seems to be the removal of the shadowy man as one peels off, takes off clothes, than despoiling the angelic power. It's a pattern of interpretation which has a long history. I think what Blake writes about here is portrayed in images which he does uh, here in the context of his poem, Milton, where Blake describes Milton divesting himself of the robes of obligation. More importantly, I think, and I just wonder what the immediate impact of this image had on you, what it had on me, that I'm just going to describe now. Because I think it's possible that in this picture, Blake offers a visualisation of the ascension using Colossians 2, 13-15, in which Christ takes off the body of flesh to ascend to the Father, and the body of flesh which is taken off are those angels there who then descend to be the angelic messengers in Acts 1, 9-10. So, in the lines we've considered from the everlasting gospel, Jesus is portrayed as less a teacher of chastity or of moral virtue, but as one who enables the space for the woman to enjoy the light of life of discovering, or better, according to Blake, rediscovering the human form divine in herself, much as Blake had hinted at in his watercolour of the passage. What's striking is that in the third and fourth parts of the poem, the, uh, uh, things are, are parallels between what happens to the woman and what happens to Jesus. So, the foul fiends are driven out from the woman, just as Jesus triumphs over the serpent when he's released from the body. So, as in Colossians, what happened to Jesus at the cross becomes the key to understanding uh, what happens to humans. Redemption from a living death is a possibility for all mortals as they mirror Christ's death by putting off mortality's negative effects. That's Blake's idea. And so I come to Blake's reading of uh, Matthew's infancy narrative. I'm just going to show you that briefly. That's, that's the original page in Jerusalem. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the few pages which is just text. And uh, uh, you can just uh, see what it's like and we will concentrate on uh, the words themselves. This passage is from Jerusalem 61 and is based on the canonical account of Jesus' infancy in Matthew 1, 19 and following. Um, I, I think uh, it just needs to come with a health warning because uh, we, it's absolutely clear to me that, uh, as we know from elsewhere, Blake remained agnostic about the virginity of Mary, as uh, may be hinted at in line 10. In the context of the poem as a whole, the divine voice offers Jerusalem a word of comfort as she seeks to discern the divine presence in the depths of her hell. The words of comfort turn out to be offering uh, a reminiscence of the moment when Joseph the Just discovers that Mary is pregnant. You remember uh, the words, and they're there uh, on the text before you. I'm not going to read out uh, this passage uh, from Jerusalem 61. Uh, I'll just uh, point you to various things um, that I want to draw your attention to. Mary puts bluntly, the consequence of Joseph's rejection of her in line two. If thou put me away from thee, dost thou not murder me? Joseph speaks in anger and fury and questions why he should marry a harlot and adulteress, lines three to four. Mary responds by pointing to the character of God who goes on forgiving his bride, Israel, lines five to seven. 
in the voice of her betrothed, Mary says, she hears the voice of God. And it is a God who is compassionate and forgives sins, as well as one who is just, line 7 to 9. In other words, Mary refuses to allow angry, righteous Joseph to eclipse all that she perceives about her betrothed. Blake, the writer who has says most about the contours of the human soul, to quote the opening of Songs of Innocence and Experience, has Mary point out that the possibility of the forgiveness of sins cannot happen if she were always holy and pure, lines 9 and 10. Making errors is the nature of humanity, and that fact of life offers an opportunity to practice the forgiveness of sins. Joseph's response to Mary's words is to embrace her, line 12. Joseph's tone changes from condemnation of and preoccupation with the sin to the recognition of the person before him. This may be seen in his, ah, oh, my Mary, in line 12, rather than the earlier reference to her as a harlot and an adulteress in line 4. The use of Mary's name suggests that forgiveness consists in part in the acceptance of the other as a who, a person needing to be forgiven, as contrasted with the what, the offence to be forgiven. Using language like harlotry, Blake seems to suggest here, obscures the reality, to use Blake's words, of the minute particulars of the person before him. Thence, Joseph begins the process of his growth and understanding, as first he queries whether God does not require a price to be paid for forgiveness. At this point, he recalls the voice of the angel questioning this reparatory theology. Joseph's dream now makes sense to him in the light of um, the revelation about Mary's pregnancy and the interaction that had gone on between them. This enables Joseph to apply to himself what he has already learned in the dream to Mary's situation. As a result, Joseph's dream is interpreted as a questioning of received theological wisdom. Forgiveness does not come only after one has made oneself pure from the consequences of sexual misconduct, in lines 15 and 16. Doth Jehovah forgive a debt only on condition that it shall be paid? This last is called the religion of the gods, line 18. The moral virtues of the heathen, whose tender mercies are cruelty. God's salvation is without money and without price, and the continual forgiveness of sins, line 20. Blake doesn't see forgiveness of sins as only one sign. It's immediately followed by sentiments which echo the Lord's Prayer in lines 22 and 23. If you forgive one another, so shall Jehovah forgive you. The words, those words then continue that he himself may dwell among you, echoing, I think, Matthew 18, 15 to 20, where these things uh, come together there where two or three are gathered together, in my name, there am I in the midst. It's a passage which more than anywhere in the life and teaching of Jesus exemplifies the ways in which mutual forgiveness of sins might take place in practice. David Ehrman commented that the everlasting gospel represented a throwback by Blake to his thinking of the early 1790s, to the antinomian Jesus who lived from impulse, not from rules. That's correct, but in addition, in the everlasting gospel, and indeed in the watercolour of John 8, the interest in the iconoclastic Jesus of the gospels, as understood by Blake, is complemented by Christ as a representative and inclusive figure, more typical of the later works. The verses that we consider from the everlasting gospel blend Blake's interest in the non-conformist Jesus of the gospels with the Christ figure of the Pauline corpus, whose presence includes all in the divine body. I think we have in the two passages from the everlasting gospel in Jerusalem differing modes of interpretation applied to familiar gospel passages and relating to a theme which was dominant in Blake's later writing. In the reading of John 8, Blake picks up a theme which may have led this passage to be appended to the gospel of John, in which Jesus is ready to challenge the strict implementation of the law of Moses a theme which is found elsewhere in the immediate context of this passage, for example, in the healing of the man born blind in John 9. Blake starts by interpreting it as a challenge to the dominance of the law of Moses, but the nature of the woman's sin and the character of her repentance, probably glossing 
Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more, which is not explicitly quoted, and is then included. In the passage from Jerusalem, Blake imagines the interaction between Joseph and Mary when Joseph discovered that his betrothed is pregnant. It's a form of the retelling of the biblical story which has its analogues in some of the Jewish Targumim, where gaps in what are sparse but suggestive narrative are filled. The nature of Joseph's righteousness becomes the focus of the story. Whereas in the story of the woman taken in adultery, it's the transformation of the cultural assumptions of the woman that is recounted in this passage. It's those of Joseph. Joseph exemplifies what it means to be a just man, but one who does not apply the letter of the law and becomes more open to his betrothed and to the understanding of the angelic vision. The result is that his understanding of what is involved in the forgiveness of sins moves from one of reparation to one that reflects Jehovah's salvation, which is without money and without price. I'll return to some of the themes raised in today's lecture about Jesus and antinomianism. Both Blake's emphasis on religion as impulse not from rules and the character of his hermeneutic in the lecture on Thursday. Tomorrow's lecture focuses entirely on Blake's visual interpretations of events from the Gospels and related texts. I spent an hour in this lecture on looking at two examples of Blake as an exegete of aspects of the life, character and teaching of Jesus. Two aspects have emerged from the passages. They were put summarily by Blake. First of all, the words which I've quoted already, which form part of the title for this series, from his satirical tour de force, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. <coughs> Blake's Jesus is one who lived from impulse, not from rules. You can see that uh, the bottom line there. Here's Blake at his most uh, iconoclastic. I tell you, no virtue can exist without breaking these Ten Commandments. Jesus was all virtue and acted from impulse and not from rules. Who died as an unbeliever. Jesus acted from impulse and not from rules is far part of an amusing debate whereby an angel learned that Jesus, in fact, is not on the side of the angels after all. It's that kind of portrait that pervades the everlasting gospel. <coughs> Secondly, and finally, in another memorable summary, Blake epitomised what for him was the gospel. It's a theme explored in both the passages we've looked at today. I quote, There is not one moral virtue that Jesus inculcated, but Plato and Cicero did inculcate before him. What then did Christ inculcate? Forgiveness of sins. This alone is the gospel. 